Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then, use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Chapter 2, Psychological Research. This lesson will focus on descriptive research. This is the scientific research process. We're working on the step called ethical research method and design. There are three different types of designs, descriptive, correlational, and experimental. Which design you pick depends on your hypothesis. If your hypothesis is measure and describe, then it would be descriptive research. It also depends a little bit on ethics and practicality. Descriptive research designs do only one thing, and that is describe the data or variables. They cannot predict relationships. Descriptive designs cannot conclude cause and effect. A descriptive research design is simply one that takes a picture of a particular sample. So all we're trying to do is measure and describe it. Once we have some data, there are several different ways that we can organize the data and several different ways we can use uh, statistics to describe the data. So if this were a class with six point quizzes instead of uh, the five point quizzes that we have, but if it was a class with the six point quizzes, then what I could do is I could create a frequency distribution such as the little pink table there so that I can say this is how many people scored six, this is how many people scored five, I could do little tally marks, and then we get this little table. This is a nice way to start to organize the data, but a visual is oftentimes a better way to get a picture of the data. So we can create something called a histogram you probably know this by a different name. You probably call it bar graph. Um, and it's essentially the same data from the frequency distribution, only now I've got these bars. I can also create something called a frequency polygon. You may know a frequency polygon by a different name. You may call it a line graph. But again, it's the same data from this frequency distribution, only this time we've put a dot for where each data point is, and we've connected them with lines. So if you organize the data visually, you can graph the data in one of these three waves. And the way that we see most frequently used in um, descriptive statistics and psychology is the line graph or frequency polygon. Some other things we can do to describe a particular set of data is we could use descriptive statistics. One descriptive statistic is what is the middle score? So in the case of our six-point quiz, you may want to know, well, what was the middle score? But in the world of statistics, there are actually three different types of middle scores, or what we call measures of central tendency. These are ones you've learned about since probably the fifth grade. These are mean, median, and mode. Mean is the score that you probably mean when you say, what was the average score on the quiz? So the mean is the number you get if you add up all of the scores and divide them by the number of students who took the quiz. In this case, the mean is 3. The mode is the most frequently occurring score. In this case, 3 was most frequently occurring. 
You could have a bimodal distribution. If equal numbers of people scored three and four, we would have two modes. The median is the exact middle score. So if we lined up the scores, lowest to highest, and then kind of counted from each end towards the middle, that would be the median. Now part of why these three measures of central tendency are important has to do with how a distribution of scores looks. So the first example is of a perfectly symmetrical distribution. In this type of distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are exactly the same. And what you see is that the two different halves of the polygon, this beautiful little line here, are mirror images of one another. If, however, we find that the mean, the median, and the mode are not the exact same score, we know that our distribution is skewed. It's kind of off kilter a little bit. And it can be negatively skewed. That means that there's a tail out to the low or negative side. In this case, the mean is lower than the median and the mode. We can also have a positively skewed distribution. In this case, the tail is to the high side or the positive side. So we're looking at the tail. And then the mean is higher than the mode and the median. If this, these three um, distributions were the distributions for the scores on the quiz, which distribution do you think most students would hope we had on that first quiz. Most students would be hoping for a negatively skewed distribution. That would mean that more students scored on the high end than on that lower end. So we have measures of central tendency. We also have a determination of skewness. There's another thing that we will look at with describing data, and that has to do with variability. So were the scores all about the same score, or was there a lot of variability in the class? So in the case of a hypothetical six-point quiz, if we got a grade that looked like this for the class, what that would mean is that nearly every student in class got the same score. The scores had very little variability. You were all kind of in the same general area. If we got a distribution, if we got a distribution that looked like this, then it's a little bit short, it's a little bit squat visually. And what we would conclude is that there was a great deal of variability in the class. The scores were sort of all over the place. Now there is a statistic that we use to determine how much the data varies. And this is called the standard deviation. And it has to do with how far away from the mean most scores are. This distribution here would have a very low variability, a very low standard deviation. Most scores are really, really close to each other. This particular distribution would have much higher uh, standard deviation because there's a greater degree of variability. So that symmetrical bell-shaped curve has another name. It's called the normal distribution. And what we have found with lots of research on human characteristics is that a lot of them have this <clears throat> uh, symmetrical bell-shaped curve with these fairly uh, standard, standard deviations. And so we call this the normal distribution. Sometimes it's called the normal curve. 
and we see characteristics such as human height distributed in the normal distribution and we see characteristics such as IQ distributed like the normal distribution. The normal distribution has some um, characteristics that we can look at. So in the normal distribution we call the um, point where the mean, the median, and the mode all line up on top of each other, zero. And then we can see how many scores are one standard deviation above the mean, and how many scores are one standard deviation below the mean. We call scores that lie within two standard deviations of the mean statistically normal or sometimes we'll use the term within normal limits. So 95% of the population will be within two standard deviations either below or two standard deviations above the mean. Scores that lie outside this area greater than 2, less than negative 2, would be considered statistically abnormal, they would be weird. Um, in the case of height, for example, almost all of us lie within two standard deviations of the mean. Some of us are a little shorter than average. Some of us are a little taller than average. So it, we're just in different areas here. But for the most part, when you encounter a new person in your day-to-day -day life, their height is not remarkable. There are, however, a few remarkably, extraordinarily uh, short people in the world. When you encounter one of these people, they would stand out to you. They would be unusual from your usual experience. The same is true on the tall end. So there are tallish people but that then above two standard deviations from the mean, we have extraordinarily tall people. These would be people who you would remark on, oh my goodness, that is a very tall person. I've never seen anybody so tall in my life. So these are the unusual cases, and they are statistically abnormal. So this normal distribution is used quite frequently in psychological tests. They give us a relative measure. That standard deviation helps us to determine if a score is normal or abnormal, if it's high or low. And quite frequently, we convert those scores on the normal distribution into something called percentile scores. So if you look down here at the bottom of this chart, these are the percentile scores. So most of you have taken psychological tests. For example, any sort of standardized educational test is a type of psychological test. So the COMPASS test, the ACT, the SAT, um, any sort of standardized class test in your classroom like the MAP test or the Iowa Basic Skills. All of these tests, when you got your results back, gave them as percentiles. So if you were at the 99th percentile for reading comprehension, that would be this group right here, you would be exceptional. You would be unusual among the people who took that test. If you got a percentile score of 50, the 50th percentile, that would mean that you were exactly average. You were on, right there on the mean. And so you had um, the exact average score you could possibly have. If you got, say, a score at the fifth percentile, that would be a low score, but it would still be within the normal limits range. So these normal distributions have been used to help compare and, con and contrast your performance, your height, all different sorts.